Okay. If you get a plant from somebody, an orchid that you haven't had before, then you're going to ask a whole litany of questions. What should be the temperature? How much light? Blah, blah, blah. And then eventually you get around to when should I repot it? And you would think that the best thing to do would be to repot it in whatever it's, re whatever it's potted in right now. But it could be better, number one, if you repot it right away into something that's more suitable for you, or at least when you do go to repot it, that you put it into something that's going to work out for your conditions. Because, like, I'm from Michigan, you're in Oklahoma, you could be buying plants that are in, from Hawaii or from Taiwan. They can be coming from a lot of different places. So you need to know about your conditions and your plant in order to find a good potting medium and pot to go with your orchid that fits your schedule. So what should you be asking yourself before you figure out what you should be potting in? Know thyself. What is your watering schedule? Now I've already talked to two different kinds of people in the five people I've talked to so far. Are you the sort of person who has a very busy schedule, orchids are important to you, but you give them one day a week and they're going to get watered that one day a week, whether they want it or not, that's what they're going to get. Or are you somebody who likes to spend time with your orchids and you look at them every day and give them a little mist, again, whether they want it or not. Uh, are you a daily person, a bi-weekly person, or, or a weekly person? Know what you want to do. <clears throat> What's, how's your humidity? Now, you guys are pretty dry. Isn't that true? For the most part, you probably do a lot to try to increase the humidity in the area around the plants, maybe have humidity trays like I know Janita has. Um, and we have to do the same thing. Michigan is not very, uh, very humid. So we actually spray the greenhouse, spray the floors just to increase the humidity in there, try to keep it around 50 or 60 percent. And you know that that changes with the time of year. The winter is god awful trying to keep the humidity up because the, because the um, heat is on all the time and that's very dry. So know your humidity. And then what's your temperature? When it's hot, your plants are going to dry out faster. But if you have them outside and you get a lot of rain, you need to know about that too. So know what your temperature is and how fast your plants are going to dry out. Okay. Can everybody yes. hear? Everybody all right? Because there is one, I could go one little bit higher. Okay, can you? All right. Okay, very good. I think if you just hit enter, that works too. There you go. Huh. No. Know thy roots. Your, the roots of your orchids tell you a lot about how they grow and what they want. The fatter the orchid root, the less water they need on a regular basis. Of course, they all need water, but when they have big fat <coughs> roots, they're protected from desiccating, from drying out. So they don't have to get misted every day, necessarily, necessarily depends on who they are. Um, but when they've got, when you've got really thin roots, like this is a Pleurothallid, I do believe, when they have very thin roots, they're going to dry out really fast, like a typical house plant will. And so you want to make sure that they're not going to be in a, in a root, in a potting medium, where they're going to dry out too much, too fast, again, depending on your watering schedule. And remember, too, that plants that have pseudo bulbs like this guy up here, this is a, a cattleya. If they've got pseudobulbs, that's a water storage organ. So that plant is not going to dry out as fast as this plant, which has no pseudobulbs. Okay, so know your plants, know the structure, and especially the roots. Those fat roots, are you familiar with the velamen? Everybody know what that is? That white mm -hmm. part that's around the root? Okay, next slide. Oh my gosh, there are, there's a list this long of things that you can pot plants in. I mean, there are so many different things, and they, this, is just, this is just a few. So you've got typically bark, 
that's what we see, I think, most plants potted, most orchids potted in. And there are different grades of bark, very fine for seedlings or things that have finer roots up to really chunky bark, like I have some of these uh, vandas planted in. And then you've got moss. I find that people either love moss or they hate moss. And the people who hate it, they really hate it. Um, I love moss. Moss is probably the most misunderstood of all of the potting media up here. And I'll talk a little bit more about moss when I talk about the neos, because neos are traditionally planted in moss. But I, I love moss. Um, clay pellets for hydroponic, for semi-hydroponics. I haven't messed around with that very much, but I know a lot of people who do that really like it. And it can be good for people who tend to overwater because it doesn't hold on to water for as long. Um, and then you got other stuff, usually things that you tend to mix in with your potting media. Uh, perlite or sponge rock or grow stone, all of those things are white and they're very light and they're inorganic. And so they don't hold on to water, they give you more air spaces. Charcoal is added a lot of times for people who, um, or for plants that need to have cleaner water. It takes some of the impurities out of the water, and it also does not really hold on to water, so it, it increases the porosity of the mix. And then you have things like coir and coconut fiber. These are from natural sources, but they are a little airier than, than bark is. For me, I have never been a huge fan of bark, even though bark has its place, and I have stuff planted in bark. The problem I have with bark is it's hard to tell when it's wet and when it's dry. Mm. So if you don't want to overwater, if you don't want your roots to be overly <clears throat> wet, I don't know, for me, it's hard to tell when you're there. Now, what you can do is lift up your plants, right, and see how heavy they are. That can tell you a lot about how much water is still in that pot. But I, I have too many plants for that. So, um, yeah, so bark is not my favorite. Um, moss, I'll just, I'll just say, moss is misunderstood because it's misused. If you overpack plants in moss, you might as well pack them in cement. <laughs> because it's either going to be bone dry or it's going to be soaking wet and not dry out until Christmas. So it's the misuse of moss. If you use moss lightly, it's probably the most perfect of all the potting media because it, it gives you moisture, humidity around the roots without being soaking wet, and it has a lot of, water, a lot of air spaces in there again if you don't overpack it so you get this good mixture of moisture but air and it will dry out fast again if it's not overpacked did, so did you ever use moss as a supplement yeah you know a lot of people do use moss in um let's say you've got pleurothallids south american species that have finer roots so you you want to have a mix that will hold on to a little more a little more moisture for longer then putting moss into that mix works really well yeah so yes it can definitely be an additive as well uh paths i i don't speak on paths i don't figure paths out i love pathy pedlums i'm not a i'm not an expert but i have seen it in those mixes a lot of the a lot of the people that I know that grow paths, they get um, it's like these peat, almost like cut, chunked up peat moss. Yeah, so it, it's more chunky as opposed to the fibers like you like you'd see here. Yeah, yeah. So for plants that need more moisture but also like air around the roots, that I think that uh, moss is a is a good um, potting media. It's really expensive right now, though. It's really hard to get good, high-grade moss. So, although I love it, it's not cheap. That's, yeah, Keith. I don't know. There's, there's different varieties of moss, obviously. Oh, okay. I get spangled moss, uh, the light color from yep. at Lowe's. Okay. For like four ninety-five, the big bag. Is that Are you getting sphagnum? It's sphagnum moss. Really? Okay. 
Um, but not long strand. Right, right, right. Yeah, so there's New Zealand moss, Chilean moss, Peruvian moss, and Spanish moss. Spanish moss is right out. That's a completely different, that's a completely different thing. Okay, not that. So of those other ones, there's New Zealand moss, Peruvian moss, which I haven't found, but I'm going to look for. That's what they've been using in Japan. And then Chilean moss. Um, I looked for some Chilean moss from one of my suppliers, and he said it was so full of, of weed seeds that he wasn't even selling it to anybody. The New Zealand moss is hard to find. It's hard to get for the distributors. So then for us retailers, it's, it's just really expensive. Um, and then the New Zealand comes in different grades, uh, 3A moss, which is moderate size fibers, up to, and then 4A and 5A, and the 5A moss is sometimes like this. The, and the, those fibers are ridiculously expensive, and it's because they're all hand-picked in order to get them to be that long. Yeah. All right, next one. Um, yes, yeah, so here are, here are some of those other things. This is growstone. Um, I do not get any kickbacks from growstone, but I do love it so. Uh, I like it better than perlite because it comes in different sizes and it's a little bit heavier. You know, perlite, you sneeze and suddenly it's everywhere. Um, so I, I really like that a lot as a mix-in. So you could put it, use it strictly by itself, but I like this mix with other stuff as well. Here's uh, an example of a, of a plant that's growing semi-hydroponically. And you can see those happy roots down in there. And the clay balls get wet, but you don't have standing water in there, which is good. And then this is, uh, this is coir, which is basically just fibers. And it doesn't hold on to a whole lot of water, but it gives you some substance around the roots. Pot, again, as many different things as there are to pot in, there are that many different kinds of pots as well. So start out with those that have the most air, and that would be mounts, which can be a clay pot. This is actually a closed clay pot. You can put water in it, and that evaporation keeps the pot cool, which keeps the plant's roots cool, and a lot of orchids really love that. Um, I've actually started mounting some of my plants on broken clay pot shards, and they really like it a lot. So, um, but typically when you see mounts, you see things like cork or, um, or tree fern. So that gives you a lot of air. If you aren't somebody who likes to water your plants often, don't mount your plants, okay? Don't do it. You will be sad. <laughs> um, the next most airy for, uh, thing to pot in are baskets. Um, these are you can use slatted baskets, or you can use, like I have over there, um, some three-inch pots that are basically just mesh pots. That's essentially a basket. That allows a lot of air around the roots, so the roots are going to dry out fast. And if you like baskets, you're going to have to think about what else is in that basket besides just the roots. And again, you've got to think about how often you like to water. Clay pots are probably your best orchid all around good choice. They breathe well, which is good. Um, so you get air coming in, but not super fast. So if you're a once a week kind of waterer, that's really good. If you're a once a day kind of waterer, that's great too. And again, clay stays cool, which is nice for orchids because even those warm growers like cooler roots. Plastic is totally fine for most orchids, unless they really like to dry out fast. Um, and then you can find plastic pots that have almost no holes, or you can create your own holes, create more holes. Um, there are now these clear plastic pots, which are great because you see exactly what's going on in there. Um, I know that a lot of fowl growers are, are going for these pots because Okay, they're potted in bark. I already said I can't tell when I need to water. But if you've got a clear pot, you can see when your roots have gone from being green, which means they're still wet, to being white, which means they're ready for some more water. So that's a, that's a nice option if you feel really insecure about your watering regime. 
Holes or no holes, again, if you know yourself, are you a water, an, an overwaterer, an underwaterer? If you're a once a week waterer and your plants are just hanging on, go for no holes. That will help you extend that water period. If you're a once a day waterer, go for all the holes you can get. That's probably <laughs> your best bet. All right, next slide. Okay, the perfect combination. Know yourself, know your plant, and you'll be able to put these together. So, are you an underwaterer? Do your roots tend to dry up? Do you tend to get shriveled leaves? Okay, if you're an underwaterer, go for a finer grade uh, medium, something that holds on to more water, and put it into either a plastic pot or maybe a closed clay pot. That is going to work for you. And just so you know, you might avoid species that have fine roots because you're going to kill them. Or you're going to have to change your ways. Okay, so know yourself. If you're a diligent waterer, if you are able to water some things more and some things less, then I would just go with whatever the person who sold it to you says is the best combination for that plant. If he says or she says, well, I like growing this in sphagnum and I, I like these pots the best, try that. And then you may have to, again, uh, change things up if you find that that plant looks like it's suffering from uh, underwatering or overwatering. And then finally, if you fall into the largest classification of orchid growers and you are an overwaterer, then you might go with a larger mix, either larger bark or maybe try the semi-hydroponics if you want to get fancy, um, and or a more porous pot. So maybe a clay pot if you're in plastic, or if you're already in clay, maybe a clay pot that has more openings, or try a basket. That will give you even more air coming into, the, into that pot and drying things out more. Um, all right, so what if you had this plant, this beautifully grown Phalaenopsis, um, how often do you think you should water that plant? Not often. That's right, that's right. So, you know, if, if you like some of these South American species or species that have high water needs and very fine roots, but you're very busy, then something like this can be a, a great idea for you. You can even close the top if you want. So terrariums, which are really hot right now, at least where we are, um, terrariums are a great way to avoid the water question entirely. Just water at once and wait a long time. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so somebody like this, you water it and just, he's pretty good for a long time. All right, that's what I have. Oh, yes, okay. Oh, yeah, here's, here's an example. So that was something in moss that wouldn't need to be watered very often at all. Here's a guy that's in a chunky bark mix. Um, I like this for a lot of my stuff because I water, I'm in the greenhouse all the time. I can water as often as I need to. So big chunky bark mixes work well for me. And it's good when you have bigger plants um, and, and pseudobulbs, okay? So that's something that's going to dry out pretty fast. I think that's all I have for, for pictures. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, I'm growing a uh, Neostelis Lucinari. Uh, Lucinari. Yeah, Lucinari. The pot I it came in, uh, the roots were kind of bound and going around, so I moved it to a <clears throat> mesh basket. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I water it with uh, kitchen water. Okay. Sorry to say. But uh, I wondered about using <clears throat> hanging uh, Spanish moss over the outside. Yeah. That, uh, I think that's help? a great idea. Yeah, I did a show with Andy from Andy's Orchids, and uh, they had these big things of Spanish yeah. moss that they didn't sell. They're like, here, because we're not taking this home. So, yeah, and I have some, 
that, uh, that is just hanging in the greenhouse, and it's right by some of my South American stuff, and I, I was moving things around the other day, and I saw that a bunch of roots from that hanging basket of South American stuff had gone right into the moss. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I like that in there. That's good. Again, moss is good. It's a good thing. Yeah. So roots be anywhere in sunshine at all? No. Sure, yeah, yeah. So the magic thing about orchid roots is their ability to photosynthesize. They are actually adapted to, to be in the sun. Yeah. It only gets two or three hours in the morning anyway. Sure, sure. So, and you know when you water this, it's going, it's, it's going to turn the, the vellum in, the white part, those cells turn clear, and then what you're seeing underneath are the chloroplasts, and they're doing their thing. So when a plant does this, I know you, you can ask yourself, like, were you unhappy with the pot? What's the problem? Um, but if you're seeing good root growth, you're doing it right. Don't change anything. Now, one thing that you can see that might tell you something is bad is um, for a plant like this, if, it, if none of the roots grows down and they all grow away from your medium, your medium is bad, okay? You're either too wet or too dry or something. It's not happy with the medium. Now, these guys are just growing every which way. It's just happy. Um, and this is an example of a basket, I would call this, not a, not a wooden basket, but a plastic basket. The roots can do whatever they want. If they want to stay in where I've got a, I've got a mixture of grow stone and large bark and styrofoam peanuts. So it's very airy and they get sprayed every single day. Happy, happy. When they're in a basket and they're circulating, is there anything you do about that? Or it probably, if, if it's still circling yeah. and it's a bit, it's able to get out, but it's not getting out. Well, it's a big net, net basket, kind of like that. It's a big net. Okay, but it's it's, it's choosing to down. okay, and it's yeah. choosing to circle instead of going out. Yeah. Probably it's saying I like where there's more moisture. So take the basket off. Well, it's, I would say it it wants to stay in a pot. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you misted it more often, yeah, then it might, yeah. And I know you said you're working on getting your humidity up too, right? Yeah. What have we got? Right, exactly, I know. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're all under limitations. We all have limitations. I mean, I have a greenhouse, but I have one greenhouse. The whole thing is like one big greenhouse. So I have to move things like, just like you do in your house. Okay, which area has the most light? But well, now I can't put you there because that's where the heat comes in. So you're gonna, you're just gonna have to be over here. Okay, so I, I deal with the same thing as you. I just have a bigger growing space. Um, yeah, but if you're getting those circling roots, to me that says whatever you have in that pot, it likes, and it, it's looking for more water. One more. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, taking time. No. The that's leaves, one. The leaves look like they're starting to form a V shirt, uh, shape not being flat. They're water. Problems. Yep, it's one that's a water thing. Water. Yep, not getting enough water. Okay. Yeah. So you could be a daily waterer and still not be getting enough water. Yeah, so a guy like this, this was something that I learned relatively recently. Vandas. Vandas have these big chunky roots which are I mean to me this is the coolest part of the whole plant. I don't even care what it I, I love roots. Um, the best way to water a vanda is not just to give it a little mist, but wait until, like, mist it. Wait, go do something else. Mist it, go do something else. Mm -hmm. And come back and mist it again until these roots are solid green.